I've heard lately from a number of online environments that they're doing very well. They're up right now. I think mainly mm. due to COVID, a lot of folks went to online or the online environments have grown or skyrocketed. But Lewis, I think your traditional school, your brick and mortar school, ground campus, in-person education, these schools are all really fighting for their lives right now. Welcome to the Market Call Show, where we discuss what's happening in the markets and the impact on your investments. Tune in every Thursday on Apple Podcast, Google Play, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Welcome to the Market Call Show. This is Louis Giannis. I am the founder of WealthNet Investments. Today, we have an interesting topic, and I'm really excited about diving in, so let's get going. very special guest today, Matt Chin. I've known Matt for a long time. And first of all, welcome to the Market Call Show. And Thanks. I'm Louis Giannis, founder of WealthNet Investments. Today, I'm really excited about talking with Matt because we're going to be talking about something that we always hear people ask questions about. And people just want to know, how can I best finance my college education for my child and my student? And people have lots of different viewpoints on this and lots of different concerns. And I'm really excited about having Matt on because Matt's been working in this field, this whole field of financing college, and he's seen a lot of different scenarios and pitfalls and advantages. And so what we're going to be talking about today are what are some of the best ways to finance college, given people's different situations, mm -hmm. maybe mistakes that people can avoid, and even really how students and parents can maximize their investment in higher education, because there's a lot of question even about that. Right. Right. Matt, why don't you tell me a little bit about your experience and role? I know you were a student loan. You worked for UNISA. Is that what you're UNISA. UNISA. UNISA, that's right. Yeah. It's a student loan servicing company, right, in Denver? That's right. Yeah, and you work with institutional loans and tuition payments. Tell me a little bit about your role and what you've been doing there. Absolutely. I'm working on my 13th year, actually, in higher education. So I made the move. We're a student loan servicing company. We service federal loans and, like you said, institutional loans and payment plans. And we're a small business. You know, we're very similar to the large servicers out there, but we're much smaller. Mm -hmm. So I got a phone call 14, 13 years ago, and the owner had asked me, do I know anything about accounting software? And I did not. And I said, I don't, but I'm a quick learner and I'm in sales. And so I was brought on to sell. And then I was able to use some of my management and operations experience to help the company grow and help with operations and management as well. So it's just been such a tremendous opportunity for me. I plan to be here for the rest of my career, knock on wood, but I've been able to actually partner with colleges and universities across the country to help them service their federal loans and then also institutional loans and payment plans. So we typically partner with a institution and then they start sending us accounts that we can service. And so we have call centers, our billing students, we're emailing them, calling them, helping them, reminding them of their obligations and their payments. Mm -hmm. And so it's been great. And we've really been able to help schools. The environment's very competitive right now, and everyone is doing everything they can to fight for enrollments. And so mm -hmm. a lot of the products we've provided help them provide innovative and creative financing programs to help with enrollment and enroll more students. But you brought up something that's really interesting, talking about reminding students about their obligation. One of the biggest problems that you mentioned to me when we had kind of like a little pre-call was people's financial literacy. Mm -hmm. So, and I know you've been really an advocate of helping students understand how things work. Walk us through the basics here of mm -hmm. how things work, because I know traditionally we're in the investment management business. So right. traditionally we're kind of on the front end where people fully fund their college at, for the most sure. part, sure. but, but for the vast majority of people, they are not able to do that. Right. Right. So there's different types of loans. Can you walk us through just the basics of the federal student loans, private loans, et cetera? 
Absolutely. Yes. So you probably heard of FAFSA or federal student loans. It's a free application for federal student loans. And essentially that's one of the readily available, most common ways to finance higher education. I think an advantage is it's readily available to all. It's typically based on income and credit. If you look at what we just went through with COVID-19 and a national pandemic, federal student loan repayment has been on hold since March of 2020. 20. That's due to end at January month end 2022. Mm -hmm. So you could look at that as an advantage. If there's ever a situation like that, loans could be put on hold. With federal student loans, Lewis, I think what a lot of folks don't realize, there's an origination fee of typically one to 2% for subsidized and unsubsidized loans. Unsubsidized loans, interest is accruing from day one during the enrollment period and during a grace period. So if you take a look at a four-year program, you know, interest is accruing for all those months and years before any payment is made. You've probably heard of a parent plus loan. That's a common federal student loan. Currently, that interest rate's at about 6%, and that origination fee is about 4.22%. Oh, wow. So I think some of the disadvantages there are the origination fees, the interest. There's always an opportunity that perhaps federal student loans could be forgiven or a portion of those forgiven. That's been a buzz out there and kind of a hot topic, a, right topic now. a hot topic. Right. So you could say perhaps that's an advantage. And then, you know, typically the next route is funded private student loans. Those have nearly dried up since the recession of 2008. One of the main banks that we work with, First National Bank out of South Dakota, they exited the funded private student loan marketplace completely in 2008. If you look at Wells Fargo, they hung in there for a while. They have exited the funded private student loan marketplace as of earlier this year. Why do you think they've done that? It's a great question. Wells Fargo had, you had to be an approved school with them. So basically the school partnered with Wells Fargo first and then the students were eligible. But I think that they were tough to get. They were credit based. A lot of students were being denied and not eligible. There you and, know. I, and I think I problems with repayment and kind of how you started mm. with this topic. I think that there is a tremendous need to educate our children on financial literacy and being a loan servicer, a common question we get every day is, well, no, this was my financial aid. I thought this was free. I didn't think I had to actually pay this back. Wow, so just yeah. an understanding of a loan and that it needs to be repaid. Mm, yeah. And there's so many, you say the vast majority of students are have student loans today. Absolutely. Okay. Yep. Cause the number is enormous. Yes. In terms of what's out there right now. So the private loans have dried up. And then what would right. be the next that would like payment plans or what are some of the other ways besides the... Yes. So, you know, with your private student loans, they're typically tough to get. There are a few folks out there still doing it, but they're tough to get credit based mm -hmm. interest rates, I would say, are comparably high, typically six to 12 percent. And then after that, typically every school offers some type of payment plan and even your traditional elite type university, like the University of Colorado, you know, okay, here's your cost for the semester. Can you pay it in full? No. Okay. How about a four or five month payment plan? Typically payment plans, they're no or low cost, no origination fee. There might be a very reasonable fee, like a $50 fee to enroll in the four or five month payment plan, but no interest. It's interest free. So that's a huge advantage. A disadvantage perhaps is it's a large monthly payment. You know, if you take take a $20,000 cost over four or five months. So those are big monthly payments, but you could say an advantage of rather than a family having to pay the whole thing in full up front on day one, they could finance it over four or five months. And not pay any interest, most likely. Interest-free. Yeah. So if somebody has a 529 plan, would mm -hmm. they still be eligible to do that? Let's say I have all, yeah. I'm pre-funded, but I, I just want to still make the payments. Absolutely. So that makes a lot of sense. Yes, people, because they're going to get tax free growth in that 529 plan while and then pay over time and right. not pay interest. So that, I don't know why anybody would not do that, actually. Right. And I'm a big supporter of the payment plans. And I think what's tough is you have that situation where it pays as you go, essentially paid over the semester. What I kind of advocate and strategize with a lot of schools on is, 
hey, would you consider pushing that payment plan out slightly rather than four or five months? What about eight months or 10 months or 12 months or two years? And a lot of schools are fearful to extend it after graduation because the student's gone and they still may Mm. have a balance. Right. I think that's what I foresee more and more schools coming up with innovative, creative financing options in the way of a payment plan Mm. where they say, well, gosh, you can't pay it in full over five months, but what about 10 months? Or would we be willing to take the risk and offer you a 24 month payment plan with in-school payments and out-of-school payments? But definitely I'm a huge supporter of the payment plans, interest-free, very reasonable cost to enroll in something like that. If you can afford them. If you can afford it. That's the big thing. And a lot of people may not be able to afford them. So this is kind of leads me to another question that you hear so many different stories about the state of the universities today. What trends are you seeing that affect students and parents right now with the universities themselves that you think are important to think about? Interestingly, I've heard lately from a number of online environments that they're doing very well. They're up right now, I think mainly due to COVID. A lot of folks went to online or the online environments have grown or skyrocketed. Mm. But Lewis, I think your traditional school, your brick and mortar school, ground campus, in-person education, these schools are all really fighting for their lives right now. There's been school closures already for smaller schools that enrollments have just dwindled to the point where they were forced to close. I foresee more school closures. I foresee mergers of schools. I've had some Mm. clients actually merge together. So they're fighting for enrollments. And you and I were strategizing not too long ago, but the experts say that, you know, when the 2008 recession hit, there was a large chunk of folks that stopped having children. And they foresee that by 2026, that's when that will actually kick in, where there will be significantly less graduating seniors that will be going to colleges and universities. So Mm. there has been a tremendous push for enrolling students. I think all schools are typically down enrollment wise for the most part. They're fighting for enrollments. They're trying to stay competitive. And so I really do foresee in the future schools having more new, innovative ways to finance education. I could see the more traditional type schools saying, you know what, we don't want to have to offer a 12 month payment plan, but we should try it to help more students to enroll more students, as opposed to saying, here's the cost. Can you pay it in full? No. Can you pay it over five months? No. As opposed to just turning that student away. I see more and more schools coming to me saying, you know what, we might be ready to offer some new type of financing to stay competitive. If you worry about your investments, need to make complex financial decisions, or pay unnecessary taxes, the lack of proper financial planning and investing may already be costing you a great deal. When you are ready to turn your peace of wealth into peace of mind, go to WealthNetInvest.com and click on the Schedule a Call button to talk to us and get a free consultation today. This reminds me of the whole trend that we've been seeing in financing education or saving for education. You know, over the years, traditionally financial planners have always said, hey, look, inflation for higher education is going to be higher than the regular inflation rate or the overall inflation rate in the economy. Maybe if the overall inflation rate is going to be two to three, tuition and room and board and all that's going to be more like six or seven. And so you always plan for that. And there was a lot of government related support and financing and stuff that kind of kept prices moving at above average rates to the economy. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if this is going to bring it down to more of a normal inflation rate with pricing and that universities are going to be not forced, but I guess forced to manage their budget in a different way. I agree. I do think that's the case. And we've talked about what's the value of traditional higher education today. Is there still value there? And I think there is, but I almost think it's really by program and by major. Mm -hmm. And I think these are the tough conversations we need to have with our children. And we need to strategize with them to say, look, if you're set on going to that traditional elite university, what are the majors and programs you're interested in? What does that cost look like? What does the anticipated employment look like and salaries and earnings? If you even take and look at my two younger brothers who are 10 and 13 years younger, they excelled in math and science. They both pursued mechanical engineering. They went to Purdue and Oklahoma State, and those you know, were not cheap places to 
go, but they got their degree in four years. They got employment right away and the earnings are significant. You and I have talked about Lewis. There was just an article last week about a liberal arts graduate that had over $200,000 in student loan debt and is making $40,000 a year. Yeah, that's tough. It's hard to make those numbers work. It's very tough. And then you look at the opposite end of the spectrum. I have a client in California. They train truck drivers. They provide CDL certificates. It's a six-week course, believe it or not, a month and a half, $3,500. And folks are out there working and making money. And I know that's kind of a tough example because that could be tough for someone with a family. But, you know, you kind of look at that versus the major and the degree. And I think that's what the conversations and strategies we really need to have with our children. I have a four-year-old at home. She still has a ways to go, but she's very hands-on. And I really want to have a strategic chat with her early on to say, you know, what do you really want to be? And you even look at the non-traditional type schools, career colleges, vocational schools. We work with some of them and they, you know, welding, aviation maintenance, nursing, medical assisting. And a lot of these are short programs. They're a year or less and could be potentially way cheaper than a four-year traditional school. And folks are out there in the field working quickly and gaining experience. Yeah, this is really about maximizing higher education investment. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really important for students to actually understand the economics of work. You can't put a value on a human being, but there is a value of the human being's work. And so that's one of the things like I have twins that are 14 years old, they'll be 15 in November. Mm -hmm. And I, (laughs) being that I'm a a finance guy, they have education from me too, luckily. I wish I had had that when I was a kid, but I'm trying to teach them, like, you need to think about how you are going to add value to society because your wage, your salary, or if you own a business, if you become an entrepreneur, that's all related to your ability to add value over time. And not just the people need to think that way, like, where's the value going to come from? And then they also need to think, I think students need to think about things from the standpoint of what is my unique ability and Mm -hmm. what what are my passions? And I need to be involved with what I'm naturally good at and also have a passion for and try to match that in the marketplace where the marketplace will reward you the most for what you naturally have talent for and that you're really interested in. So to me, it's it's almost like an education of try to find that talent, try to find that unique ability and try to match it in a marketplace that's going to compensate you well and realize that it's not people just giving you money. You know, like when you're raising your children, you give them an allowance and all that stuff, but they make that transition to, I am now a productive citizen in the world and I need to think about the value that I'm creating. And that whole education I'm really committed to, I've had lots of conversations, not to get off topic with our clients, students who are about to go into college to try to help them make that transition. Because a lot of times the children, they don't want to listen to their parents, right? (laughs) They, They want to listen to somebody else. Getting back to what you were talking about, the pitfalls, what are some of the pitfalls in the financing of education that you're finding? You may have heard with federal student loans, they have income driven or contingent repayment plans. That's also been kind of a big buzz topic out there. And I think they were designed to help a number of students based on their income, perhaps have a reduced student loan monthly payment. But I think what a lot of folks don't realize is that not a lot of folks actually qualify for this. There was an article just last week out of millions of folks who are enrolled in these plans, and they typically market them as get into a income contingent or driven repayment plan. And after a period of 20 to 25 years, your remaining balance will be forgiven. Well, as of last week, an article came out that 32 borrowers out of millions have actually met that criteria and had these loans canceled. 32, that's it. And another thing what a lot of folks don't realize is it's a tax liability. So say you have, you know, your 40,000 in loans after 20 years that are erased or forgiven, it's counted as income and there could be a tremendous tax liability. I surveyed a Colorado grad not too long ago, went to a career college in Colorado, had about $10,000 of loan debt and his servicer quickly got him on an income based repayment plan based on his income. And they said, how's 50 bucks a month? And he said, oh, that's great. I'll get on it. He was paying $50 a month for years, didn't really think anything of it. And he one day looked at his billing statement and he realized he was paying roughly $48.50 to interest every month 
less than $2 a month to principal. And he, once he realized that he got on standard repayment and he said 50 was great. It was a reasonable payment every month, but I had no idea. It was so much interest and so little principal. Mm -hmm. So what are your thoughts about the federal government in terms of, I know we're kind of moving into speculative territory. So with that being the caveat, you know, we all understand that, but what is your thought about how the federal government may change college funding in the, say in the next five years? You know, I think just if I could speak very briefly to the proposed forgiveness, if you will, of loans, while it's always a possibility, I think that it's very unlikely. Mm -hmm. I think that if there is any widespread forgiveness by borrower, I think it would be a small amount, perhaps three or $5,000, maybe up to $10,000 at the max. But I do think it's unlikely. If you look at, Lewis, the vocational schools, career colleges, they're some of the most heavily regulated sector out there currently. And they have to meet a requirement called gainful employment. Basically, their programs have to be proven to be successful. They have to provide employment to their grads that are making income. So I don't know if I perhaps foresee that in five years, but I do see as a whole public universities private state schools, I feel like you said there's going to have to be more accountability for schools, for programs, and a relationship to the debt. You know, I think that in the future, a student won't be able to have so much debt and not be employed or be employed in a field that has a very small income. So I think that would be the future, more accountability, more, you know, if you will, weeding out of perhaps programs that do not provide gainful employment and income. I think that's what the future holds. Mm. The goal would be to not have folks saddled with debt and have folks in programs and majors that likely will provide great employment and great income to pay. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Like, wouldn't that be nice if the universities actually had some accountability? I'm not bashing universities, but I was just thinking about how anytime, and this is kind of Mm -hmm. a basic economic truism, Anytime you have something that is subsidized, you, know, you can look at agricultural subsidies. There's all different types of subsidies that we've seen throughout right. time in economic history. You get these imbalances and then you get things that don't make economic sense. And right. I think we're having to, given the fact that we have so much debt in our system, right. there's not a whole lot of leeway for us to just be forgiving a ton of loans. And we have so many of them. They may try to come up with some other plan with maybe making tuition free or less. Right. Or if they do something like that, I think that would be very costly too. And that's going to change the whole landscape of what the universities are going to look like. So it'll be interesting to see how that all pans out. I wanted to throw out, Lewis, you brought up a great topic. Something to keep on families' radar is potentially free community college, which some Mm -hmm. states are rolling out. Keep in mind for families out there, it's typically just the tuition and doesn't include transportation, living expenses, et cetera. My concern with the community colleges has really been the product. And you can Google and research some of the outcomes, like the graduation rates. And and it's surprising, but some of the community colleges, if you look at Arizona and California, 15 to 30% of, of folks are graduating. So that would be my concern. And then I think, you know, it's like we've talked about if it's free, is there skin in the game for the student if it's free, but definitely something to keep on family's radar that I do think free potentially community college will keep rolling out, but I've just had a concern with the product perhaps. Yeah, it'll perhaps can dilute the value of it. So it's really important to actually capture the value. And I think we have to, as parents, we have to teach our children what that means because no one's going to bail you out. You have to know yourself what you're doing and get good advice from parents. And I'm glad that you were able to, that leads me to kind of our last question. So what is the best advice you have for parents and students who are like in high school today, and they may need some financing? What would be your best advice for them? You know, kind of to start, like you always help your clients out with Lewis, save often and early, save as much as you can to give you an opportunity to have funding for higher education and perhaps the opportunity to avoid taking out any loans. I really encourage families and their children to have those 
somewhat difficult conversations early on, promote financial literacy and just understanding of, you know, this isn't free. If we have to take out loans, it's a loan. It has to be paid back. Here's what credit looks like and interest. I would really look at those majors and programs, like you said, things that our children are passionate about, but also Mm. having them fall in line with the anticipated employment opportunities and income. A lot of these colleges and universities, Lewis, they do tuition discounts discounting right now because they're fighting for enrollment so much. Mm. So I would definitely inquire to the schools you're looking at, their financial aid offices, their bursar offices. Is there any opportunity for a discount in tuition? A lot of schools will commonly discount even half or more of half of the tuition cost. That's good advice there. Right. And I would ask too, for any grants and scholarships, Mm -hmm. I asked the college, is there any non-federal or state grants or scholarships that perhaps just the school is offering? Sometimes they have donations from alumni and endowment that they'll just give it away in the forms of grants or scholarships. So I would really ask those kinds of questions. And if they offer any types of extended payment plans, because I see more and more schools that are offering innovative, longer term financing plans plans. Mm-hmm. And those could be the ones that really help a student out. And you may not have to pay it in four or five months, but maybe it'll give you 12 months or 24 months to really help get a student enrolled to help them go after their dreams and goals. That's excellent. Excellent advice. Well, Matt Chin, thank you so much for coming on and giving us a rundown on what's going on in the financing world for college. This is big, big, important stuff for many people out there. So I appreciate all of your help and advice. My pleasure, Lewis. Thanks for having me. For the latest episode of the Market Call Show, make sure to like, subscribe, and follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. If you enjoyed the content of this episode, please leave us a review and comments. The information in this podcast is informational and general in nature and does not take into consideration the listener's personal circumstances. Therefore, it is not intended to be a substitute for specific individualized financial, legal, or tax advice. To determine which strategies or investments may be suitable for you, consult the appropriate qualified professional prior to making a final decision. WealthNet Investments is a registered investment advisor. Advisory services are only offered to clients or prospective clients where WealthNet Investments and its representatives are properly licensed or exempt from licensure. 